we read the words very truly, I tell you, you will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. That's an important statement. And yet, for those of us that are in the midst of pain, it is hard to imagine sometimes that we will ever know the other side. John's community, the community that was receiving this gospel, would have known pain. And yet, I can only imagine that they used those words as a reminder. A reminder to themselves that though we are in the midst of pain, we trust God. That there will be a day of joy. Let us, as we think about those words from John's gospel, quiet our hearts and prepare for worship. Please stand as you're able and join with me in the call to worship. When loneliness comes upon our lives, the grace of God is there. When sadness casts its heavy shadow, the promise light of Christ appears. When grief traps us in the confines of despair, This is what our faith declares. This is
please join with me in prayer. We seek a closer walk with you, O gracious God, in all the circumstances of life. Whether we are joyful or grieving or a mix of emotions, be our companion. O Lord God, come alongside us as we worship and pray, sing and break bread. Make yourself known in this time and place so that your eternal presence is more clearly seen in all times and places. This we pray in the name of the one who desires to walk with us each day, Jesus Christ. because he is a grandfather once again. Zachary Paul Hutchison snuck into the world Wednesday this week, a little ahead of schedule. Mother and, dog, uh, mother and grandson and all are doing well. I want to congratulate him and also thank God for all the blessings that have come our way this week. Now let's give one another a warm welcome. And children, you can come forward at this time with our children's time. God is amazing. 
and that God continues to connect to us. God is always listening when we pray. And that moment where you think, oh, you know, I haven't prayed in a long time. Maybe I should pray. God isn't like, well, because you haven't prayed, I'm out of here. No, God is right there, ready to take your call, if you will, and to listen to what you have to say. I mean, this is amazing to me that the one who is the creator, the one that has the entire world to worry about, is also concerned about just you, you as an individual. That's pretty awesome. You join me in prayer, and that means we're going to connect to God. God, we give you thanks for this opportunity when we can call upon your name, when we can reach out to you, and we know every time, every time, you will listen. Continue to give us the love that strengthens our lives so that we might, with each passing day, become more and more like Jesus. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming, and I invite you all off to Children's Church. Our scripture reading this morning is the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for our songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. 
Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, Happy shall be they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. You join me in prayer. Speak to us, O God of gracious. Fill us, O God, with life-giving words. Transform us, God, by the means of your empowering words. This we ask in the name of the incarnate Word, Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you in maybe college or some other organization went through a pledge season or something like a pledge season? Anyone? A few. And it doesn't have to just be a fraternity or sorority. Sometimes it's a club, an organization that wants to put a real emphasis on joining. Well, in college, I went to pledge season. And there are many stories that I am too embarrassed to share, especially in a sermon in front of my congregation. But there are a few, and one of them was in the middle of pledge season. I did not remember my big brother, that is the big brother in the organization, his family tree, and then at concert. And so later that day, I was picked up in a car and driven to a busy intersection, as busy as the intersection is in Enid, Oklahoma, <laughs> and I was handcuffed to a stop sign where I was supposed to lean on the stop sign and wave the smile on my face to all the cars that went by. I was told that they would come by sometime later to get me. It was funny for a little while, but try looking happy when you are stuck, when you are tied to that which is causing your frustration, when you are unable to escape from the source of your unhappiness. And that's where I was. When people find themselves in those situations, others will often say, oh, just cheer up. Turn that frown upside down. Think happy thoughts. Which, you know, when you're going through a situation where you have a, well, when you have a mild case of the blues, making that conscious choice to say, I'm going to look for something positive. I'm going to try to be a little bit more happy today. That can sometimes work. It can change your perspective. But when you're in one of those situations where simply looking at the glass as half empty or half full doesn't work because the glass is empty, or you don't even have a glass, well, all of a sudden, in those situations, those little pithy sayings are worthless. They mean nothing. I'm talking about those times when your sadness has been brought on by, by grief, by hopelessness, by a despair that just runs so very deep. 
I'm talking about those experiences that far too many people know so very well. And experiencing a deep sadness. And yet people will try to look happy, to try to hide it. And yet that kind of sadness always, always rises up to the surface. It will always rear its head. Before I go any further, though, I want us to be honest here. That when that kind of sadness comes on your life, Counseling, a professional therapist, even medication, they are not a sign of weakness. They are not a sign of a person having a lack of faith. Our culture's understanding around mental health is rooted in misconceptions and fears, which have kept people for far too long reaching out to a professional counselor when needed. And that kind of professional treatment is, in my opinion, a part of God's ongoing work of healing in the world. But I also believe that there are hints to what I call insights. Insights we find in Scripture, Insights that we find through the world around us that provide for us tools when it comes to dealing with sadness, when, it, when that comes into our lives. And the scripture right in front of us this morning, the scripture from the Psalms is one that I think might help us. Even though its words are troubling, even though they are really confrontive, at least to my heart, as it begins, the, the collective community, you hear in this voice a sadness that is beyond measure. It is the ancient Israelites. And as this psalm is being written, they are a people who find themselves in captivity in Babylon, what is known as the Babylonian exile. They have been taken away from the only land that they have ever known. They've been taken away from Jerusalem, the centerpiece of their faith. They've been taken to a foreign land by foreign captors. And there they are struggling. Because everything that they have known about themselves, about God, about their faith community, was centered in Jerusalem. There at the temple that is now some 700 miles away from them and lies in ruins. The entire city of Jerusalem, it was devastated by that experience. And so here they are in this foreign land and their tormentors, the scriptures describe them as, I think these are people that are just toying with them, keep on saying, oh come on, sing us a song. Sing us a song out of your old faith. And you just hear the voice of, this, of the author of this song. How can I sing a song of faith in a foreign land? How can I do it? And as you continue to read, you just feel the sadness intensifying with each passing verse. I'm reminded of the words of Robert Frost, who points out that grief becomes a problem. When this grief gets hardened into grievances. Or as I have often said, a sadness solidifies into something that begins to ensnare us. It begins to capture us and hold us. And that's what we see happening in verses 5 and 6 of this psalm. I mean, it's one thing to name your sadness. It's important to name that grief that is in your life, that heartache. But there is a point where that is no longer helpful. And that's what happens here as those verses announce what is known as, a, as an ancient curse. When the author says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. It's one thing to just remember. 
remember, to think back to something that has been lost. But that's not what's being talked about here. What you hear is the voice of one who is tying themselves to what has happened. Here is someone who has handcuffed himself to something that does not move. Here is one who has locked himself in the past. has locked himself inside. It happens. It happens if we let it happen. Our sadness will begin to solidify into something that ensnares us, that engulfs us, that controls us. But hope, hope is not found in the past. Hope is something that is discovered in the future. And healing is not encountered by clinging to whatever that past memory is. It is by moving forward into the new thing that God is doing. But we've all seen what happens next in this psalm. <coughs> Suddenly, the voice of this author, it turns to bitterness. And the bitterness even moves from that. The bitterness suddenly becomes anger, and this person is full of rage, a sense of vengeance in everything he says as he takes out his emotion against, of all people, the innocent children of his captors. He wants to see the infants, the young children of his enemies dashed against the rocks. How does he think that will solve anything? How does he believe that that will bring healing? How does he believe that that is going to solve this struggle, this conflict he is in? Trust me, revenge never, never releases you from that stuck place, from that tomb of sadness. In fact, it often hardens our experience there. But it was John's gospel those words that I opened our service with from the 16th chapter, Jesus saying to us, yes, you will know pain. Life experiences pain. When we choose to be vulnerable, when we choose to love, when we choose to open ourselves up to others, there will be loss. There will be brokenness. There will be times of pain and sadness. But then he goes on to say, but your pain will be turned into joy. Now the word turn, or at least the word that we translate from the original Greek of the New Testament as turn, it means to come into existence, to come forth. This is not a return to what was, but a turn toward the new happening, the new thing that God is doing in our midst, something we probably have not yet seen. And yet to do so assumes a trust, a trust in the God who once again is trying to unbind us from the past, trying to release us from the sadness. Now it's important to remember that doesn't mean you will forget the past. We are people that have been created with the capacity to remember. God isn't saying forget, but God is inviting us to not tie ourselves, to lock us in the tomb of the past. God is beckoning us forward. Dan Mosley, for years, served as a pastor within our denomination. But while he was serving a congregation, his wife died. And like anybody, he was devastated by this and didn't know what to do. And Finally, he transitioned out of ministry and started serving one of our denominational seminaries as a, as a teacher. But shortly after her death, a friend of his offered a cab, saying, just get away for a little while. And so Dan did. And as he was staying there at the cab, one evening he went down to a beach close by and watched the sunset. And as he watched the sun beginning to set, there was something within him that said, run. And so all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, he began to run, run toward the sunset. 
and he ran and he ran and he ran as hard as he could and finally in exhaustion he collapsed onto the ground and he lay there for a while crying and as he thought about what had just happened he realized that something inside of him was telling him catch the day catch the day before it is lost and maybe by catching it you can turn it back but he knew it was impossible. And finally he got himself up and he realized the only direction to go was to turn to the sunset. Turn back to the sunset and to begin to walk into the darkness. Because it is only on the other side of the darkness that one finds a new dawn, a new day. But that sense of hope that sense of going into the darkness, trusting, believing that on the other side of it is a new day that's hard. This idea of a new creation on the other side is what we talked about on Easter Sunday. But we have to trust that the God that again and again rolls away the stones from the tombs that we are stuck in will do it again. And even though as we stand in that tomb, it appears to be dark, we need to trust that our God is rolling it away. Or as the 23rd Psalm reminds us, that well-known Psalm about the Lord being our shepherd, there's a very important word in that Psalm. And of all words, it is a preposition. For it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley or through the shadow of death. I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We walk through. I've said it before and I will say it again. That's probably the most important word in all of the 23rd Psalm for it reminds us that God does, want, does not want us to put up residence in the darkness. No, God is leading us, walking us through the darkness to the other side. The prayer that we know as this Psalm has the potential of, of leaving the person stuck because you just hear the anger leading to bitterness, to leading to the sense of, of vengefulness. But because it is a prayer, because it is a lament offered up to God, even though it is ugly at times, even though it is brutally honest, there's something about naming that before the one who is calling us, who is beckoning us through the darkness and through to the other side. I've often said there are times when you need to trust your way into a new way of living. Though trusting God doesn't mean that it's going to be an overnight transformation. It doesn't mean you just get a three-point plan and you can crank through those three points in a couple of weeks and then it's all good. It is a journey. It is a journey with God. It's a journey in prayer. It is a journey with those around you who will support you and encourage you. Sadness, sadness is not God's chosen destiny for you. Let me say that again. Sadness, it is not God's chosen destiny for you. And though the world is filled with experiences that will cause sadness... And though you will know sadness in your life, that is not where God intends you to live the rest of your life. The good news that we find again and again is that God is rolling away the stone so we can exit the darkness and into new life. When I heard this woman named Stephanie speak for the first time, it was at this wonderful church gathering about 10 or 12 years ago. She was wearing this bright, beautiful dress but she had this black armband on, and that caught my attention. She explained to us how four years earlier, her husband had died, the young age of 38. And she, like anyone in that situation, was devastated. And she chose not to change anything about her house. She said she didn't give away any of his clothes. In fact, the suit that he was going to wear that day still hung months later on the back of their bedroom door. The outfit, all black, that she had worn to the funeral, she bought three other outfits similar to that, and that's all she wore. She just rotated them every four days. 
after months like this, a friend of her sent her a card. And on the front of it, it said, tomorrow is a new day. And when she opened it up, her friend had written these words, really? Really, she wrote, tomorrow is the first day of your new beginning. She read it over and over again. And, she, and Stephanie, as she was explaining this to us, she said, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. And yet I called my friend, she said. I called her up and I said, will you commit to calling me three or four times every week to be my encourager, to keep me accountable? And she promised. And then she sought out a couple of other folks in the church who promised every Sunday to meet her five minutes before worship and to pray with her. She dug into her purse and found the card that had been given to her months earlier, the card of a counselor. And she got on the phone and made an appointment and began we meeting weekly with that counselor. And then she started reading the Bible, starting with the Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the one her pastor had recommended. And it was there in the fourth chapter, she found the words that said, clothe yourself with a new self. And later it said, Put away all bitterness, all anger, all sadness, all malice. She hung on those words, clothe yourself with a new self. And she said, I didn't feel like putting on a different dress, but one morning I did. I put on something that was bright colored. And though it didn't reflect where I was, I put it on. But then she said, I went over and I got my husband's suit and I cut off one of the cuffs and I made it into an armband. She said, I knew I would never forget him, but I knew God was calling me to something else. I believe that God was calling me out of this sadness and into new life. Four years later, she said, I don't want to pretend to you that, that it's been easy, and I don't want to say that I have gotten there. It is a journey, and it is. But we are a people who claim a belief that even though sadness will come upon us, even though we will know darkness, it is not that place that God wants us to reside. Sadness is not God's chosen destiny for you or for me. Of all the miraculous things that God has done, making the past the present is not one of them. What God is really good at is taking those things that ensnare us, those moments in which we feel as if we are locked inside a tomb and then working to begin to set us free, to move out of the darkness and into the light, out of the tomb and into a new life, a new creation, a new opportunity. And even when you are in the darkness, even when you cannot imagine stepping out of that, that is when we trust the one who again and again and again has worked to draw people out of the darkness and into the light. It doesn't mean you will forget the past. It doesn't mean you will forget those that you lost, those who, who have died. But it does mean that God doesn't want you to live there. God is calling you out of the sadness, out of the brokenness, out of the darkness, and into the light. Our God continues to roll away the stones, to roll away the stones, in this case, of our sadness and invite us out of the tomb and into new life. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. God of new beginnings, of new life and new creation, 
we confess those things. We sing songs about them. A few weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we shouted, Hosanna, hallelujah, Christ is risen, risen into new life. But often our sadness and our grief, they eclipse it all, leaving us inside the tomb of our own heartache and sorrow. Yet even there, in the darkest of places, we hear the whisper of your spirit saying to us, this is not your chosen destiny. Merciful and kind God, comforter and friend, we open ourselves to you with honesty, with brutal openness, confessing all the emotions associated with our sadness, emotions that can change day to day, but we trust, we in fact, we believe that that you are beckoning us to move forward. And even though there are times that we cannot begin to imagine it, we know in faith you are the one who stands alongside us, inviting us into a new day, a new creation. Of course, we won't forget those people and those situations that are lost, those that have died, but God, we know that you want us to be a people of joy. Loving Lord, continue to guide us into those places where the memories of the past can be celebrated as, as we also celebrate new life, new opportunities. Lord God, there are many in the life of our congregation who are in need of prayer. And we lift before you this day, J.D., Willie, Ann, Angie, Kay, Marilyn, Marvin, Carolyn, and Linda. Lord God, we know that in the midst of their, their hurt, some of them in the midst of their sadness, that you are there. But we also pray when the opportunities arise that you will use us so that we might be a witness to your grace and to your love. Lord God, we also lift up those around our community, around our nation, and around the globe this day who continue to grieve those who are brokenhearted, whether it is because of natural disasters or those kinds of disasters brought on by the brokenness and anger of others. We pray, O oh God, that you will continue to work to heal, to mend, to bring communities back together. We know that's who you are. We trust that you will continue. But this day, O oh God, we simply allow ourselves to speak honestly, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable before you, the one who will heal, the one who will beckon us out of the tomb and into new life. We offer these words in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before us is a table, a table with simple elements of bread and cup. When we are in the darkest places of life, it is hard to even imagine that God is there. Well, I think one of the one of the important truths that we find at the table is that God can be experienced, that God can be encountered in, of all things, a little piece of bread and a cup of juice. It reminds us that God expresses the divine nature of love and mercy and kindness in unexpected ways. And it teaches us to make ourselves more aware, to open ourselves to the possibilities of how 
God just might be speaking to us amidst the darkness. May this table, may the experience of communion help shape you this day. Let us prepare for a time at the table. All are welcome to this table. We receive the elements by intention, by taking the bread and dipping into the cup. On the first occasion in which this table was experienced, the night in which our Lord was betrayed, it was a time of sadness that was transformed in just a very few days into a great time of gladness. If you come this morning with a glad heart, be thankful to God. And if you come this morning with a sad heart, look for that power to transition you from sadness to gladness. Come with expectation. Likewise, come with thankfulness. Let us pray. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God and creator of all living, I present myself humbly to you today as I pray at this table. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing your son, Jesus, to be born into this world of sin. He taught us how to live. He taught us how to love. He taught us how to forgive, Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, if there be any among us today that whose hope have faded, I pray that they will look to this cross when they come to the table and what it symbolizes. In Christ Jesus lies hope for all and his grace. I pray, Heavenly Father, as we take of this loaf, which is his body that was given for us, and as we drink of this cup, which is the New Testament, in his shedded blood, that as often as we take of these elements, we will do so in remembrance of him until he come again. 
It is in Christ Jesus' name that I ask these blessings. Amen. And on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he did take the bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. Having drunk from it, he shared with it his disciples. said, this is my blood, my life, the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. We do this in remembrance.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Father, we know that this is true. All blessings flow from you. And we only put back a very small portion into this plate of the many blessings that you have given us. Not only money, but so many other things that are much more important than money. Lord, help us to be cheerful givers of our talents and our time and our money. That we might use those to go out and help others and to show your love to the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to think that most all of you here have never experienced sadness, but I know it's not true. I know that if you are a human being that is living life, there's going to be heartache. For people who've chosen to be vulnerable, who've chosen to love others, there's going to be times of loss and hurt, and that brings on sadness. And yet, as people of faith, we've got to trust that that is not the place God desires for us to ultimately reside. God is always working with us, working through others to work with us, to lead us out of the darkness and into light, from the tomb to new life. Here at Cypress Creek, we always extend an invitation an invitation into, that, into this covenant community. And again, that's part of that journey, is to surround ourselves with people who will be encouraging for us, who will be a source of strength. If you desire to connect your life with this congregation or to commit yourself to God for the first time through Christ, you can either come forward as we are singing our hymn of discipleship, or you can talk to one of our church elders or one of the pastoral staff immediately after the service out in the foyer. I invite you now to, to join your voices as we sing together.
Let me share some things that are happening in the life of our congregation this week and then looking ahead. Hopefully earlier in the day you were able to get by Tammy's reception, welcoming Tammy Nelson as our new children's director over in Holy Ground. But you can still welcome her if you see her in the hallway or wherever. Um, it is a blessing to have her on staff. What a gift she is. Also want to encourage you to check out the Youth Bake Sale. There might still be a few items out there. Um, that is money that they are raising for their mission trip, both for the high school and the Cairo trips this summer. Want to lift up the Inquirer's class if you are relatively new to Cypress Creek. Each Sunday morning at both the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock hour in a little room here to the side called the Bride's Room. Uh, John Gordley is there, and he will lead you through a time of in which he will share uh, some about the history of Cypress Creek, as well as our denomination and field questions. So uh, we invite you to go in for that class. Next Sunday, Sunday afternoon, is our area assembly. Uh, the 50-some churches in our area will be gathering in Beaumont. Um, that's about the, as far to the edge as our area goes, but we're going to be going there this year uh, for worship gathering there between 3 and 3.30 next Sunday afternoon. If you'd like to carpool over, give the church office a call. I will warn you, um, the same guy you will hear Sunday morning will be preaching Sunday afternoon. Sorry, I'm the preacher then, but it will be a different sermon. So uh, I invite you to come and be a part of that and represent your congregation in the area gathering. Two other things looking ahead. June 30th, seems a long way away, but it'll get here before we know it. That's the Sunday before the 4th of July. And on that Sunday, we are going to be having one service, 10 o'clock that morning. All three services gathering together because we are going to worship together, dress casually, more casually than usual, because then we're going to go from this place out to a picnic, right here on the grounds or maybe in the gym, depending on the weather. But I uh, want you to put that in the back of your mind, put it on your calendar so that you do remember just one service on June the 30th. The next Sunday, July 7th, we're going to go to the matinee as a congregation of Godspell at the Texas Repertory Theater. So uh, put that on your calendar, and in the next week or two, there will be an opportunity to sign up. Uh, there's reduced prices for a group rate. I think it will be a great afternoon for us to, to share in what is always a great show. And then uh, um, I heard that Ellen over there, there she is, just became a great grandmother a week ago or so. And so we celebrate with her um, on that marvelous gift. <laughs> there are a lot of moments in life where new life enters in. And it is a good reminder of what I think God is always trying to do. And again, it's not an overnight experience. It's not a three-point plan and you'll just plug through it and get through it and it'll all be good. It's a process. In fact, it's a lifelong journey. And yet the good news is that God journeys with us every step of the way. I invite you to grab the hand of somebody close. Gracious God, in the midst of those dark moments, when sadness seems to overwhelm us and we feel trapped, we trust that you will be the one that stands with us, that will encourage us, that will hear whatever we have to say in the midst of our frustration. And yet, because we open ourselves to you, we will hear you whispering ever so quietly that this is not our destiny. This is not where we are to reside. So continue to work with us, loving God. And when the opportunity arises, allow us to be agents of grace and mercy in the lives of others helping to call them out of their sadness and into new life. We offer all this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.